the candidates are back on the campaign trail, putting their own spin on the second debate. We'll show you what they're up to and what voters are saying now. Coming up on ATVN, we'll show you what Red Cross volunteers from Southern California are doing to help those most affected by Hurricane Matthew. And I'm outside Bridge Hall. That's where the new Blackstone Launchpad Center for Entrepreneurship here at USC has moved to. And coming up, I'll talk with two students who say that the advice they got here at the Blackstone Launchpad helped them start their own businesses. Annenberg TV News is next. Live from USC, you're watching Annenberg TV News. The battle for the White House is playing out in key states. Good evening, I'm Etienne Smith. And I'm Rachel Frain. We have our political anchor, Aiden McMillan, with more on the presidential candidates. Aiden? Thanks, Rachel. Today, Hillary Clinton campaigned in Michigan and Ohio, and Donald Trump made appearances in Pennsylvania. Clinton shared her thoughts about the debate. She made reference to Trump's performance in light of leaked audio in which Trump made vulgar comments about women. Did anybody see that debate last night? Well, you never saw anything like that before. I'll tell you what. Donald Trump spent his time Trump attacking also shared his perspective of his opponent's performance in the debate. All crooked Hillary could do was talk about small, petty things last night. During the course of 90 minutes, she was exposed and her failures were exposed. She had no defense. All she could do was lie. She lied so much last night. Trump has been under fire since Friday when an Access Hollywood video um, from 2005 was leaked to the Washington Post. In the recording, Trump made offensive comments about win women, bragging about groping them because, quote, when you're a star, they let you do it. NBC News and The Wall Street Journal conducted a joint poll on Saturday and Sunday after that audio was released. In the poll, Clinton leads Trump by 11 points among likely voters. According to the poll, Clinton has 46 percent of support from likely voters, while Trump, Trump has 35 percent. The rest of the poll's participants said they plan to vote for third-party candidates Gary Johnson or Jill Stein. This double-digit lead is especially important for the Clinton campaign, since polls over the past few weeks have had her and Trump in an ex extremely tight race. On a conference call this morning, Speaker of the House Paul Ryan and told other members of Congress that he will not withdraw his endorsement of Trump in response to the Trump audio, but he will no longer defend Trump or campaign with the Republican nominee. Trump responded to Ryan via Twitter and said, quote, Paul Ryan should spend more time on balancing the budget, jobs and illegal immigration and not waste his time fighting the Republican nominee, end quote. Trump is no stranger to insults. Throughout his campaign, he said offensive things about Latinos, Muslims, a disabled reporter, and women in many other instances. So what is it about this video that's made it the last straw for some Republicans? I spoke to USC professor and former De Democratic campaign strategist Bob Shrum to find out more about the significance of this recording. The video that came out from Access Hollywood on Trump is vivid, vicious, and profane. Uh, it's also private. It's something he said in private, not in a speech. So it reveals to people what he really thinks, who he really is. He said it when he thought no one would ever hear him or no one would ever see it again. Uh, and we saw a little bit of his soul and it was pretty ugly. It goes without saying, but with so little time until Election Day, it's a dangerous time for Trump to be in recovery mode. Rachel and Etienne, back to you. Thanks, Aiden. Donald Trump says his comments about women were, quote, locker room talk. In the debate last night, he used the phrase three times. He also tried to deflect the issue by saying we should focus on more important issues. When politicians use this kind of language at the level of a presidential debate, which is unprecedented, it really lowers the conversation of the whole country. Locker room banner, in this case, was a way of disguising what he was describing as sexual assault. Some students on campus rejected Trump's defense that his comments were locker room talk. It's something that should not be normalized, cannot be normalized, and I don't think that um, 
there's anything that he can do to justify his statements. I think I've been an athlete for four plus years in high school and I've been in a locker room probably more than Trump and it doesn't make any sense because that's not what we talk about in the locker room. I think by him just trying to brush it off is, you know, trying to minimize the impact that it had, but in reality it's, it's, it's his character. You know, what he says behind closed doors is very revealing of like who he, he is. Students also seemed concerned about how Trump's comments would affect his campaign. Undecided voters could still play a big role in this election. Some may have looked to last night's debate to make up their minds, but political science professor Justin Holmes says the debate might not have been too helpful. They're radically different in style. They're radically different in content. So if ever there were debates that were going to make a difference, these might. It's two not very popular candidates heading up the major parties. And, you know, I, I think, if anything, they're looking for some reason to vote for somebody rather than against the other one. And, you know, I'm not sure that they got that. Undecided voters will get one more chance to listen to both candidates talk about the issues at the last debate. It will be held next Wednesday at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Cleanup efforts are underway after Hurricane Matthew tore through the southeast coast over the weekend. People have taken to the streets to remove debris left over from the high winds and flooding. High waters continue to pose a threat for the rest of the week, with at least three rivers predicted to reach record levels in South Carolina. Annenberg Media's Mark Salinger found a group of Los Angeles volunteers who will soon be in South Carolina to help with the cleanup. Mark? Thanks, Rachel. Hurricane Matthew struck thousands of miles away from Los Angeles, but some Southern California residents are making the lawn drive cross country to help those who lost the most. A lot of devastation, a lot of people in need of help. For Red Cross volunteer Sandy Hanagami, sitting on the sidelines and watching the devastation of Hurricane Matthew is not an option. When I see someone needs help, I want to get in the Red Cross emergency vehicle and drive across and help. Today, she led a convoy of vehicles from the Red Cross of Los Angeles as they began their four-day trek to Columbia, South Carolina. Their goal is simple, to help in any way that they can. When you see someone who's gone through something so devastating, just to be able to give them a hug, to let them know it's going to be okay. They'll join more than 50 Red Cross volunteers from Southern California already in the area, providing cleanup assistance, shelter, and food. Vans like this one can serve hundreds of people with food and water in the areas most affected by Hurricane Matthew. Once the teams get down to South Carolina, these boxes will be loaded with the food and given to those who need it most. This this uh, machine we in, I call it a machine, is a kitchen on wheels. From inside his disaster response vehicle, Henry Mills will provide hot meals. The most important thing they do besides food, they need someone who care. They need someone to show that they care. Hurricane Matthew left a path of devastation from the Caribbean all the way up through North Carolina. Some students at the University of South Carolina rode out the storm in Columbia. It was just like really windy and a lot of rain. We didn't have school though last Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Now that the storm has passed, the work to clean up is just beginning. That's where the need is. And if the need was here, the people from South Carolina would come and support us. Now, the University of Southern California is also providing assistance to any students who are affected by the hurricane. If any students need emotional counseling or support, they're asked to contact the Office of Student Support and Advocacy. Thanks, Mark. The Metropolitan Water District says the drought will still, is still in full effect. Find out how the city plans to conserve water. A parking lot now could be affordable housing. Why one group says that that won't happen if an initiative passes in March. More on this coming up next. And a popular plaza at Union Station reopened its doors. We'll take you there to see the changes coming up.
We do anything for kids. Yet one in five children in the U.S. struggle with hunger. Help end childhood hunger near you. Learn how at feedingamerica.org. Got a quarter? The Neighborhood Integrity Initiative aims to provide more affordable housing in Los Angeles. But some say if it passes, rent prices will actually go up. Kevin McAllister shows us competing visions on how to construct a more affordable LA. The sights and sounds of a new building going up, to some, signify the number of affordable housing options going down. I think it's a, a crisis that's been building for a long time. The Neighborhood Integrity Initiative on the March ballot would pause development for two years. In effect, it would push a reset button on what some say is a broken development system. They're of course wiping out the middle class housing while they do this. And we're saying, uh-uh, time out, we need a plan. Kirk LaPointe, a one-time mayoral candidate in Vancouver, says his city suffered from the same types of policies on the books in LA. It drives people out of the city. This is luxury, almost all luxury, and throwing in a couple of units. So every time they do one of these projects, we lose another couple, five here, a hundred there, affordable housing units. But it's lots like this one, one of 12 identified by the city that had the most potential for affordable housing that wouldn't be able to be developed on if the initiative were to pass in March. Anytime you put a ban on the construction of housing, you just make housing for everyone in the community more expensive. Expensive for residents, but also harmful for businesses. We have literally thousands and thousands of people who are working construction, and when they get done with the project that they're working on right now, there won't be another one. But experts say it's not as simple as pausing development or letting it be. We tend to simply say stop or or go, but we have to think about where. Both sides have until March to make their case. For Annenberg Media, I'm Kevin McAllister. The California drought is still in full effect, and the Water Services Resources Director says Californians must continue to make these efforts. It's imperative that all Californians remain diligent about saving water and that we continue to press this notion of making efficient water use part of the California lifestyle. USC is part of the Metropolitan District and has its own drought protection plan. Facilities management services limit the amount of irrigation on campus while housing provides students with low flow shower heads and efficient washing machines. The director of energy services at USC says water consumption has decreased 14 percent per square foot since 2010. The Metropolitan District plans to spend roughly 140 million dollars over the next two years in conservation efforts. Today is a big day for the Blackstone launch pad. The group celebrated the move for to find a permanent home at the Marshall School of Business. The charitable foundation has been on campus for three years. They have helped 250 companies get started. They are now going to be in the Marshall School of Business to share resources with the incubator there. Moving to the business school allows students to share resources with the USC incubator. Annenberg Media's Cole Sullivan is live with more on how they, they're feeling about right their up. new space. Cole? And that's right, I'm here at the Blackstone launch pad space. It's in the basement of Bridge Hall, just on Truesdale, right by Exposition Boulevard. It's a new space they moved from the Annenberg building. And in this basement space here at Bridge Hall, they have meeting rooms and different computer areas so that students can become entrepreneurs. They have different advisors come in and real life business leaders come into the space and right now I have to admit it doesn't look like much. There's some decorations in the wall but they say what really matters is not so much what it looks like but what ideas come out of there and one of those ideas is from David. And David come on in and you're a USC student, you're a junior. Yeah. Tell me about this company you started with the help of um, with the help of the Blackstone Launchpad. Yeah, so I'm currently working on drops right now and it allows people to donate their spare change to charity. So currently uh, we're working with 10 charities. 
uh, to donate their people's spare change. So, so how does it work? Yeah, so people basically, if you purchased a cup of coffee uh, and it was two fifty, we'd round that up to three dollars and fifty cents to donate to a charity of your choice. Then every week or so, you get texts saying like, "This is how much you donated this week," um, and then you actually get impact photos showing like, "This is like the, what your money was actually spent on for the charity." So you get to see exactly where your money is going. Exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of things that charities don't do today um, and that we're trying to make available to all different types of charities. So what charities are you working with right now here in Los yeah. Angeles? We're working with Big Smiles. Uh, that was our flagship charity that we launched with. Uh, they're an awesome nonprofit uh, that basically allows people to, uh, children, they provide them with art therapy uh, at the UCLA hospital. So it's a really admirable cause. It really helps like make the day uh, for these kids. We're going through some really rough treatments right now. And in under two months, we donate over $1,700 to the charity. Wow. And uh, they actually were able to buy enough art supplies to provide over 600 hours of community service. So talk about this entrepreneurship center here. Yeah. How, how has USC and how has the Blackstone Launchpad helped you kind of come up with this idea and implement it? Yeah, Blackstone has been there. Uh, this is actually one of the third projects that I've like worked on. Um, and Blackstone has been there from like day one. They've really helped me uh, just develop my own ability to, to speak, present, uh, to f focus on like different markets and trying to determine business plans. You know, they provide awesome like coaching opportunities, to, like really extend your skill set. And they're always here to provide feedback and let you know if what you're doing is right or if you could use some more improvement. So for the lay student who's just walking by on Truesdale, I have a great idea. I think it could be a good business. When they walk into the center, what, what are the first steps? Yeah, basically just come right in, say hello. Uh, you'll be greeted by like James or Ian. Um, and they'll basically, they'll just walk you through the process. You can sign up online actually at incubateusc.edu uh, slash uh, sign up. And from there, you can actually uh, schedule a venture consulting meeting, and then you can just talk to anyone in the space. They'll give you uh, feedback on your idea and like where you can move forward. And give you some advice, too. There's legal advice and all those other things that yeah. help you start a really successful business. Exactly. And they say that it's open to anyone. They work with 5,000 USC students, and those are the people that they want to help become successful entrepreneurs. Back to you guys in the studio. Thanks so much, Cole. Etienne, I want to know what you did this weekend. Well, I just studied by the pool. What about you, Rachel? I actually spent time with my parents, which was awesome. Let's see if we can spend more time by the pool this weekend with Lauren with our weather. Thanks, guys. Yes, we're actually going to see much milder conditions this week, but the sun will still be out, so at the end, you can still have your pool day. Let's take a look at our current conditions for right now. You can see that it's 70 degrees, pretty fair outside, a little bit, clou a little bit cloudy, and 64% humidity, which is going to continue throughout the week. Let's take a look at our forecast for tomorrow. You can see that it's going to be 80s in the Inland Empire and 69 in Big Bear. As we move west, you can see that it's going to be 66 along the coast, 75 in the valley. And for you surfers out there, unfortunately, you're going to have poor conditions for, um, poor conditions for surfing. Taking it back to USC, you can see that it's going to be 74 here and 73 along the coast in Long Beach and 68 in LAX. Let's take a look at our five-day forecast. You can see that it, today is actually the warmest day of the week, and it's going to cool down as we keep going. There's going to be some fog in the morning, so you may want to consider wearing layers this week so that you can slowly peel them off as the sun comes out later in the day. And the humidity amps up. Are you guys looking forward to this little change in the weather? I oh. am. I love sweater weather. Thank you so much, Lauren. Union Station's Patsoras Plaza reopened today after a three-month-long closure for safety repairs. Upgrades included new waterproofing, storm drain, and paver repairs, along with pedestrian safety fencing. Patsoras Plaza is the largest transit hub in the county, and the new repairs are meant to facilitate safer commutes for travelers. The Trojans got their second straight win over the weekend. And they are still undefeated at home. Let's toss it over to our sports anchor, Alexa Palermo. That's right, the Trojans are looking to keep their two-game winning streak alive, and the Pats got their quarterback back. My pick of the week is making USC history. Sports are next. Why is Connor having trouble focusing in school? Having trouble finding Connor's middle school? Would you like directions? No, why is Connor having trouble focusing in school? Finding lowest airfare to Istanbul. No, I'm, I'm tired of fighting with him over homework. Home, walk, restaurant, need a review? No, I need help. He's very smart, but his mind it wanders. He's disorganized. I think I understand. Oh, good. French fries, finding best potatoes. No! Russet, 
fingerling. You can't go. <sighs> Why don't you understand me? Sorry, I was trying to show how Connor feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. For the one in five kids with learning and attention issues, this is what life can feel like. ExploreUnderstood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues designed to help your child thrive in school and in life. Understood.org, because understanding is everything. Looks like it's done. Don't let salmonella get funky with your chicken. On average, one in six Americans will get a foodborne illness this year. You can't see these microbes, but they might be there. So learn the right temperature to cook each type of meat. Keep your family safe at foodsafety.gov. The Trojans are on the road this weekend for their only away game in October. USC is coming off a two-game win streak against Arizona State and Colorado. The offense has been sparked by the addition of Sam Darnold at the QB spot, who has thrown for 350 yards and three touchdowns in back-to-back -back games. Darnold is currently the fourth-ranked quarterback in the nation, but the star of the game on Saturday was the defense. The defense has seen continuous improvement throughout the weeks and had a shutdown performance last week against the Buffaloes. The team is working as a more cohesive unit and is certainly celebrating as one. Seeing Coach Hilton happy, uh, everybody hugging, you know, the atmosphere in the locker room was great. Music playing, bump, chest bumps and everything like that, man. That's the best feeling ever and uh, celebrating this win with our team. USC has won nearly 80% of its games against the Wildcats with just two losses since 2001. The Trojans will celebrate its 100th anniversary of the first USC-Arizona game this weekend in Tucson. Now, let's toss it over to Julia, who has the latest on women's soccer. Julia? The women's soccer team had an up-and-down weekend. First, the Trojans shut out number one ranked Stanford 3-0. This win marks the first time in program history that the women of Troy have taken down a top-ranked team. But later in the weekend, the Trojans dropped a tough 1-0 loss to the number 14 ranked Cal. In the victory over Stanford, the Trojans midfielder Morgan Andrews struck first, followed by another goal from forward Alex Anthony. Andrews scored again towards the end of the game, making her the top scorer for the team and securing a win over the Cardinal. Cal's goal was from forward Heather Wally during the 86th minute of the Sunday game. The loss ended the Trojans' 10-game winning streak, which was a school record for the team. The women of Troy hope to bounce back from their loss on the road next weekend as they travel to Arizona State to face the Sun Devils on Saturday. The men's water polo team again proves how dominant their defense is by holding both of their opponents to only four goals this weekend. The number three ranked Trojans dominated number eight ranked Pepperdine with a well-rounded performance. But the highlight of the game was junior goalie McQuinn Barron becoming USC's number two all-time saves leader. Barron racked up 14 saves against the Waves, while 10 different Trojans scored goals to win them the game 15-4. Later in the weekend, the Trojans had a dominant 24-4 win over the number 17 ranked UC Irvine. The defense continues to be a strong point for the team. In regards to our defense, it's just effort and intensity and working for each other. So if we dress that and we really you know, put a lot of emphasis into defense, then you know we're going to get rewarded for it. So I think last season, you know, we were a little bit lackadaisical in that regard, but it's something that we've addressed at the start of the season. We really pride ourselves on is that defense, and it's showing. The Trojans are looking to continue their reign of dominance while they take on number seven UC Santa Barbara on Sunday. The Patriots quarterback Tom Brady returned from a four-game suspension on Saturday to lead his team 33-13 victory over the Cleveland Browns. The quarterback returned to the field and picked up right where he left off. Brady threw for 406 yards and three touchdowns. The quarterback was happy to be back on the field with his teammates. I was just pretty, you know, trying to focus on what I, you know, what my job is and what I have to do. And, um, you know, it felt very much like a normal week for me, you know, once I got into it. So, um... You know, it was fun to come out and play and, you know, fun to win. I think that's the most important thing. The team also welcomed the return of defensive end Rob Ninkovich. The Patriots will face the Bengals this Sunday at home. My pick of this week is from the Trojans' win on Saturday. Quarterback Sam Darnold threw to Tyler Petit for a tight end touchdown. Check it out. Darnold hurls the ball into the air and Petit is right there to make the catch. This was his second touchdown of the day and the third of his career. 
It was a great weekend for the Trojans. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Thanks so Alexa. much for that, Alexa. A tasty treat is now up for recall. Find out what you need to watch out for in your freezer. And we'll show you how South LA residents feel about our Nomi. Guess what? I have some news for you. There's free food right there, junk food. Do you see that truck? Oh, jeez. It's a two Michelin star chef. All for free, ladies and gentlemen, all for free. Here we have a panzanella with summer vegetables and pesto. Enjoy. How are we doing? So what do you got going on underneath that plate there? This food is really about to be thrown away. Yeah. Really? Is there, is there something wrong with this food? Where did you get it from? From farmer's markets. They put aside the ugly vegetables and the ugly fruits. Yeah. Carrot top, soft avocados. It was all food that was going to be discarded. Even the drink you had is made from like a little bruised peach. Did it taste a little it's like bruised? Great. It was good. The average person throws away 24 pounds of food a month. That's a lot. Isn't that a lot? Go visit savethefood.com for more information. Thank you. Junk food time. Adventure can be found anywhere, but the best place to start is in the forest. I spy something beginning with S. Snow? No. Snow-covered trees? Nothing to do with snow. Head outside to discover incredible animals <laughs> and beautiful plants that come together to create an unforgettable adventure. Wow. So grab your loved ones. Don't even. And explore a world of possibilities. Come on, this way. Visit discovertheforest.org to find the closest forest or park to you. Annenberg students went to South LA today to help give community members a voice. Intersection South LA set up a pop-up newsroom on the corner of Slauson and Vermont. Annenberg students stayed until late afternoon interviewing members of the community. Residents talked about issues they hope will get more media attention in the future. I think you guys are doing a great job coming out here and, and, and actually getting the community to get involved. There's, there's many people that want to get involved but they can't because there's no voice out here. And by you guys doing that, you guys are actually allowing us to speak on behalf of a lot of people. Annenberg students are contributors to Intersection South LA. The organization was founded in 2009. Check your freezers. Nestle USA is recalling 16 and 24 count drumstick cones made at the Bakersfield production facility, which tested positive for listeria. Consumers should return products or contact Nestle Consumer Service. Wow. I know, so I better check my freezer. I hope I don't have any of those products. Lauren? I have a bunch of those. I better check them. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's wow. Right. Well, thanks for watching Annenberg TV News. For everyone at Annenberg Media, I'm Rachel Frain. And I'm Etienne Smith. You can watch us on the web at uscannenbergmedia.com. Good night.